All right, good morning, uh, Liberty North AP Dual Credit Psychology. Uh, happy Virtual Wednesday. This is November 4th, okay? And today we're going to be covering brain notes, all right? We're going to be covering basically pages 96 to 118 in your textbook if you want to follow along there. Also, the two docs that I'll be referencing are in Canvas under your Unit 3 module. So you'll see uh, brain notes, guided brain notes, um, a document, and then you have a difference between the male and female brain document as well. And I'll be referencing both of those. So you can follow along in your book. Make sure you read pages 96 to 118. Um, you can follow along on the docs. You can also follow along in this presentation and go back. Okay. All right. And then, of course, if there's any questions, you can chat with me during the presentation today or you can just email me. Okay. All right. So let's get started. All right. So on the doc, what I've done is I've created a doc that just basically goes along uh, with what the book says and how it uh, organizes the structures of the brain that are important to psychology. So it's important to know that there are several ways to organize the brain. Um, the book chooses to, to focus on three main areas, the brain stem, the limbic system, and then the cerebral cortex and cerebral hemispheres down on the number three. Okay. Um, and then basically what they're going to do is they're going to kind of bring forward or kind of identify or focus on the structures in those three areas that really relate to psychology that are important to our behavior and mental processes that we might be, you know, that we'll be discussing as we go throughout the chat uh, the book and all the different units. Okay. So this is not how everybody would organize the brain, but it's how your book does it. Um, and how it, it does a good job of bringing out what the important structures are that we'll be discussing throughout the rest of the year. So we're going to do it that way. So you can follow along with it in the book. And I go in order of the book as well. Okay. So um, the first area of the brain that the book covers is called the brainstem, which is also, um, there are actually, most people organize the brain in three main regions, uh, which are hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. So since they're doing three different organizations, um, I'm just kind of including that in there, okay? So that would, be, cause that would act, the brainstem, as far as the books organize it, would, would contain both the hindbrain and the midbrain, okay? This is the oldest, uh, innermost region of the brain, and it's where the spir spinal cord enters the skull, or the brain, excuse me, okay? So, on my little brain model here that I have in my room, okay, here is the brain stem, okay, and then this would extend to the spinal cord, all right? So, it's the oldest innermost region, the base of the brain, and it connects my spinal cord to, to my brain, basically, okay? All right? All right, now, uh, the main structures that deal with psychology in the brain stem, and it, the book goes from, from bottom to top, okay? So the medulla or medulla controls basically most of our autonomic nervous system, okay? So all those peripheral system, nervous system, down to the autonomic, all those involuntary processes that keep us alive, uh, those involuntary out-of-awareness behaviors, right, such as heartbeat, breathing, okay, are controlled by the medulla or medulla, which is right here. Okay, if you watch Waterboy, it's the medulla omnigala. Okay, all right, right here. Okay, the next kind of rounded structure is the pons, okay, which are structures that deal with sleep and movement. Okay, so again, medulla, pons, and then up here at the top, all right, is our midbrain, which is very small, which is our reticular activating system or reticular formation, okay? All right, and it basically is the gatekeeper, if you will, for input, for stimuli that's coming up. So basically, any sensory information that's coming up through the spinal cord, all right, it's gonna go through the medulla pons, it's gonna get to the RAS, reticular formation, and it's gonna determine whether it is a strong enough, important enough stimuli to kind of send on into the brain, okay? So it deals with arousal, our sense of smell, um, and it just kind of sends it out to, it sends it on up if it gets approved or if it's strong enough or important enough stimuli, okay? And then lastly, the book includes the cerebellum. Okay, cerebellum literally means little brain because it looks like we have a, a whole second brain right here in the back. That's our cerebellum, okay? So here's the brain stem and the cerebellum together, all right? And the cerebellum controls, basically it's, it's famous for voluntary movements, balance, um, it does have some learning and memory um, aspects to it as well and some emotional aspects to it as well. But mainly it's known for voluntary, so that somatic side of our peripheral nervous system. Now also you're going to see the cerebellum is often 
um, bruised in a concussion. Because again, a concussion is when I have a soft tissue organ, the brain, gets slammed against a hard skull, okay? So now that can happen with you know any direction, but generally, no matter what, how the brain moves, it's generally gonna impact my cerebellum. So the cerebellum is gonna feel some of that impact, okay? Which is why, you know, they are very kind of tipsy, kind of they can't balance, they can't move, you know, right after they have a concussion, okay? All right, so that's area number one, okay? The brain stem, oldest, most innermost region of our brain that connects our brain to our spinal cord, okay? All right, number two, I'll just do this and go down here. All right, number two is what they call the limbic system, all right? Limbic literally means border, okay? So again, brain stem and cerebellum, okay? Midbrain, and then if I open it up, this is my limbic system, okay? So it borders my midbrain and brain stem and my cerebral hemispheres, okay? So it is the innermost kind of center of the brain, all right? Okay, and it, the, there are four main structures in here that have a lot to do with psychology, all right? So first one is the thalamus, which is a relay station uh, for our sensory input. It routes all sensory information to the needed parts of the brain. And actually, it sits right above the reticular activating system, so that reticular formation, and then right above it is the thalamus, okay? So if the RAS, again, deems it to be important and strong enough of a stimuli, it's going to send it all up. It immediately sends it to the thalamus, and the thalamus then directs it to wherever it needs to go. Okay, so any area of the brain that needs to then get the information, it sends it there. The amygdala, which is our aggressive, fear, kind of emotional center of the brain. We've already talked about it as it relates to anxiety. Okay, we also have some emotional memory here. So if you ever have a memory and then it kind of has an emotion or a feeling attached to it, that's the amygdala. The hypothalamus, all right, which we, I've starred here and we've already talked about is probably one of the most important structures in the brain. Okay, I'm gonna move up our document here. Okay, so I'll go back up here. Here we go. Okay. All right. So we're up here. Hypothalamus. All right. Um, so it controls motivation, body maintenance. So that internal equilibrium, which is called homo homeostasis, pleasurable feelings. Again, it releases, uh, helps with dopamine. All right. In that pleasure track. And then, of course, it controls our endocrine system, which is the production delivery of hormones uh, throughout our glands and our endocrine system. Okay. So it's a big one in psychology as far as behavior goes and mental processes, okay? And then lastly, we have the hippocampus, which is our main memory hub. Now, it's, again, not the only structure that deals with memory, but it kind of is the control center of memory, and we'll talk about that when we get to that unit, okay? So thalamus, amygdala, hypothalamus, and hippocampus are in the uh, limbic system, okay? All right, the third and last area or region or part of the brain is called the cerebral cortex. Okay, get it set here, all right. Okay, all right, so the cerebral cortex, all right, which is actually everything on top of the brain. So actually, if you look at the brain, you're looking at the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex. So this whole outer layer, outer covering of the brain is the cerebral cortex, which is the thin layer on top and then the cerebrum, which is the, the structures in, down below, okay? So if I look at it here, all right, so here's my limbic system. This would be my midbrain and my brain stem. Let's see if I can get this back on here. Okay, like this, all right? So brain stem, cerebellum, midbrain, limbic system, all right? And then we have the corpus callosum, which we'll talk about which connects my two hemispheres together. And then this is the cerebrum, okay? So this is the cerebrum, and then the layer on top of that is the cerebral cortex, okay? All right, so this is the, this is 80% 80, 80 of the brain's weight is in the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex and 20 plus billion neurons, all right? So it's a big part of the brain. 
Now the first structure I have here, which is what I've always referenced, is this huge band of fibers right here, which is called the corpus callosum. And this is what connects the two hemispheres together and allows them to communicate to each other. So it sends information, all right, to and from both hemispheres so that we have a unified working together brain, okay? All right, so if you were to spread this out and look down here, you'd see that it was attached at the corpus callosum, okay? We have the frontal lobe, yellow, okay? Which is very important. I've got it starred uh, to psychology. It deals with planning, judgment, personality, moral reasoning. Okay, so it has a lot to do with my behavior and my mental processes. Okay, I have the parietal lobe right here, right behind it, which deals with touch, spatial reasoning. So again, when we were doing our Mozart effect study, uh, tangos, our paper folding cutting, you know, we were dealing with the parietal lobe here. The very back in the light blue, we have our occipital lobe, okay, which is our main visual area. And then right above the ears on each hemisphere, we have what is called our temporal lobes, okay, which deal with hearing. Obviously, it's right above the ear. Facial recognition, awareness, and memory. All right, so there's some more memory. Actually, the temporal lobe is a pretty big structure in memory. All right, then if we go on the top and we're on the cortexes, okay, so if you remember from our vocab assignment, our code word assignment, Cerebral cortex is the outer lining of the entire cerebrum. This stretch right here, okay, here's the frontal lobe. This little band right here on the cerebral cortex is called our motor cortex. So this is what controls uh, the bilateralness of the brain. So again, this is what controls that the left hemisphere controls the right side of my body, right hemisphere controls left, okay? Um, so any type of body movement involved there is going to control. Then we have our somatosensory cortex, the light blue strip running here, which again controls our body and touch sensations, also our body position sense, okay, which again, you athletes, um, you know, congrats to the volleyball team. They're heading to state today, so good luck to them at the state final four, all right? So that controls that, all right? Then we also have association areas, which are Areas of the cerebral cortex spread throughout the entire brain, the cerebral cortex up here. So it's in all of the four lobes. But these are little areas that uh, are found in the cerebral cortex that deal with higher or higher level thinking functions. OK, so any higher level thinking, learning and behavior is controlled by our association areas. OK. Let's see if I can get this back on here. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, three main areas: brainstem, limbic system, and cerebral cortex and cerebrum. Okay. Now, let me get the dot moved down one more time. Okay. Now, how the three main areas of the brain generally are referred to the three regions of the brain. So again, um, that's why I kind of listed these because it gets kind of confusing, especially those of you who have had um, HBS or medical interventions. Uh, you know, generally, when we divide the, the brain into three main areas, it's called the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Okay, so the forebrain is basically this part of the brain. Okay, so it's the cerebral cortex, the cerebrum, and the limbic system. So again, anything midbrain, higher than the midbrain, okay? My midbrain is my RAS, so my reticular formation, so it's just the very small part there. Okay, and then, there we go. Okay, and then my hindbrain is the brainstem, medulla, pons, and cerebellum. Okay, it just sits right there. Okay, so hindbrain, Midbrain, forebrain. Okay. All right. All right. So now that we have that basis, kind of that knowledge, what I want to do, pause it here again, is I'm going to go into kind of, we're just going to run down the differences between the male and the female brain, which is good to know and good to relate it. Okay. Um, and again, the big question is uh, again, if I were hold, to hold a male and a female brain up here, you would immediately know that they're different. Um, they are different in size. And then if we were to dissect them and do a lab on them, you'd see that there are some structural differences as well. 
So the big question is nature and nurture. Are brains biologically born differently or do they develop differently because of our environment? Okay. And then at the end, we'll kind of summarize a study that kind of helps us answer that question. All right. The male brain. The male brain is, is bigger. It's larger. Right. Its average size is three pounds. Okay. So if I was holding it up here, you would notice that it's the bigger, larger brain. Overall, it has a slower rate of neural firing. So if we were doing fMRIs and we were kind of looking at neurons and their action potential, um, again, it would still be extremely fast, but the male brain fires a little bit slower than the female brain. Okay. Uh, the big structure I think that would immediately point out if we dissected the brain would be that the males have a larger amygdala, okay, in that limbic system area, which again is our emotional center, aggression, fear, right? It is larger. Um, also in that midbrain area, limbic system area, you know, we have, we have greater and stronger arousal in that parasympathetic process, that involuntary area uh, with our fight or flight. So again, that sympathetic nervous system is, is more sensitive, kind of more trigger happy, if you will, and a little bit stronger. We tend to have more development in the left hemisphere of our brain because we use the left hemisphere a lot. Now, again, I don't want to confuse everybody. We use all of our brain all of the time, okay? Um, but the males like the left hemisphere of the brain, okay? Uh, we have more ser or we have less serotonin, which is the calming, uh, kind of happy neurotransmitter, calming positive neurotransmitter. We have large levels of testosterone in the endocrine system, which again is controlled by the hypothalamus. On the right hemisphere, we, ha we have very good development for spatial ability. So again, you know, we talked about it. If you look at the brain, you know, you might generally think that the males would be better at our spatial reasoning tasks. But again, that's not what we found um, when we did our studies. Uh, the brain is, our brain is set up for visual dominance. Now again, Vision is the dominant sense in both brains, but the males kind of take it to another level there. And then our brains are generally uh, viewed as being better for ma or math and science, okay? Okay, all right, female brain. All right, so I'll go back up here. All right, the female brain. It's smaller, average weight is about 2.7 pounds. Um, the, the first structure that's gonna point out in the female brain to you as being distinct if we were to dissect it is the corpus callosum. So again, that structure of fibers that connects the two hemispheres together is almost 25% bigger in the female brain. So that is huge. And that summarizes one of the big differences. You know, the male brain fires at a slower rate and is not as good at, at processing information in both hemispheres. The female brain is. Um, it is set up to send information back and forth very efficiently and quickly. Okay. Um, all right, which is what these two refer to. Greater use of the lobes and the cerebrum, faster rate of neural firing. The brain is the female brain is a little bit more flexible. It's more placid. So again, the brain is not very good at healing itself, but what it does is rewire itself, which is plasticity, which we'll talk about uh, Thursday and Friday. And the female brain seems to be set up better to do that. So in theory. If there's a brain injury, a concussion, you know, the female brain should heal, not heal, should rewire itself a little bit better, recover. Uh, decreased levels of cortisol, better equipped for sensory information. Uh, again, females are just more sensitive to sensory information, except for vision. Uh, so the smell, the taste, the sounds, you know, are picked up a little bit more by the female. And then their brain is better equipped for reading and writing. Okay. Now, a very famous study done at Rutgers University. Um, which was to help us answer this nature nurture question. You know, why are the brains different? Are they different biologically or are they different because male and females develop in a different, in different environments? Okay. So Rutgers University randomly selects male and female babies, three months to nine months of age. They come in with their parents. All right. So again, that has to be voluntary participation, which we learned in unit two. And what they do is they set them in front of a big screen. So they just keep them in their baby carrier, the baby seat, whatever the parents bring them in. And what they do is the screen uh, is going to show positive pictures, mainly of smiling faces. So again, we know that the infant brain is very receptive, um, very attuned to facial expression and faces. It's like it's, 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 it's a survival mechanism that the babies have when they're born. So they're all pleasant pictures. And I also think there's some pictures of dogs in there. Uh, no cats in this slideshow. OK, so. The, the babies are looking at smiling people, male, female, and then they're looking at dogs, okay? 
Now, they have a string that then hangs down and rests right on the infant's belly. And what they basically take about, you know, anywhere from two weeks to a month to teach the babies is that if that string moves, the, the pictures will change on the screen. So that's actually how they activate seeing different pictures is just by moving the string. Now, again, babies at this age can grasp, but again, they're still working on their motor control of their arms and their legs. So all they have to do is move the string. So if they move it with their stomach, if they hit it with their arms, you know, their head, their feet, you know, whatever, they don't have to grasp it. Okay. They just have to move it. Now, once the babies have learned that or are conditioned to that, what they do is they remove it. Okay. So again, basically what they're trying to do is get the babies frustrated in a safe, uh, ethical way. All right. So, and they also just want to see how fast it could take them to learn that the string controls the screen. Then what they do is they connect it. And what they want to look at is the response and the females and the male babies, basically the response that we would give today. And is it different at three to nine months? And I think we all could guess what the responses are. The female babies at three to nine months cry and kind of give up. All right. So they just stop messing with the strings and they cry. The male babies get angry and frustrated and then, but they don't leave the string alone. They keep trying to utilize the string, even though it's very apparent that it's not going to work. Okay. All right. So now I think we would all probably agree that those are probably the same responses that we have today. All right. So this study along with others basically points to it's probably nature. Okay, that those genetic differences, biological differences are there at birth. Okay. Now, not that we don't have nurture influences to brain development, but basically the, the brains are set up biologically different at birth. Okay. All right. So enjoy the rest of your virtual Wednesday. As always, if you have any questions or if you need anything from me, email me. You can chat me um, and I'll see 8A kids on Thursday, B-Day kids on Friday.